Okay, so uh, welcome to the Interopoly Testbed webinar. Um, and this is uh, I'm Peter Burian, and I work for the Interopoly unit of DG Informatics at the European Commission. And uh, we are the unit which, among other things, is responsible for the ISA Square program. So the Interopoly Testbed is a service which is offered by the ISA Square program. Uh, Kostas, can you go for the next slide? Uh, I will just remind you of some uh, webinar practicalities for, for now. Uh, I mean, uh, you can connect your audios, but uh, please keep uh, the microphones muted. Uh, yeah, so uh, there will be sort of reserved Q&A sessions, but you are free to use the chat. So if you have any questions, uh, ideas, or if you want to uh, talk to people just to, for clarification, feel free to use the chat. And yeah, I'll just remind you once again that the webinar is recorded. So, um, Costas, slide. Uh, we have a very interesting ske uh, schedule for you guys uh, today. So we will, of course, discuss all the different things uh, to do with the testbed service. We're now aiming to roll it out to the different member states. And of course, we already have some public administrations in the member states uh, reusing it. So we will have um, presentations by Flanders and also Germany and uh, to they will sort of enlighten us on how they reuse the test bit for their own purposes. And of course, there will be we'll be looking at content validation. We'll be looking at conformance testing and we after each session we will have a Q&A uh, uh, session. So so basically if you could sort of reserve your questions for that one, but feel free uh, as I mentioned already to even post the questions before on the chat. Costa um, uh, slide. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, the uh, the uh, Intrapoli testbed is uh, a service which is uh, sponsored by the ISA Square program, but this is actually the last year of the program. But the good thing is, is that uh, all the stuff that we do in the ISO Square program, it will be rolled into the Digital Euro program. So the Interopoly testbed, the service which we offer, will continue. It will, of course, continue under the Digital Euro program. And as you can see, the Digital Euro program will put together uh, different different things and it will look into the future. So a lot of its focus will be on uh, things like high performance computing, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and also advanced digital skills. But uh, you always have to keep in mind that interoperability is something which is underpinning everything. So that's why uh, the different solutions, the different ser services that we're offering in ISA Square will continue in the debt program. Of course, some of these things will, uh, will sort of have a different form. So what is being done right now is uh, the setup of, a, uh, of something called a common services platform. So where we will combine the self building blocks as well as a, a range of selected ISA Square solutions, uh, among which the, we will also include the test bed as well. So the service which we are offering also for the member states. There are also uh, one of the things that will continue from ISA Square will be and which will be fortified is, uh, is an Interopoly Knowledge and Support Center. So all the um, all the support you get from ISA Square will be enhanced into this uh, Interopoly Knowledge and Support Center. Um, of course, there will also be other things in uh, in in the debt program. So you'll have uh, a GovTech incubator. You'll have digital identity solutions, uh, once only principle, and of course uh, the SESTA network. Costa uh, side. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, interoperability will be very important in the future. And uh, since you're at the webinar, you know how important it is. One of the key uh, things that we offer in the ISA Square program is the is the EIF, the European Interoperability Framework, which is sort of a which gives guidance on how to build public services so that they're interoperable. 
you have different principles, you have different suggestions on how to build these services. And uh, I would just like to remind you that a lot of times people think, you know, entropy is just a technical thing, but there are actually four layers. So there's legal entropy, organizational, semantic, and technical. So all these things have to work together if you want to create this solution. Um, Costa slide. And yeah, so I would just like to mention that whatever we're doing, so just is 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 a journey. So if you are putting different public services, you are uh, going on a journey and at different parts of this journey, you will need different types of solutions. So that's why uh, the ISA Square program right now and in the future, the that program will be offering different types of solutions which you can pick along the journey that you're you're having in your public administrations when you're creating your public services. So at one point you might maybe need the core vocabularies. You might need some geospatial solutions in another one. And of course, once you have maybe your so solution already set up and you need interoperability and conformance testing, then that's where you can uh, come in and pick up the test bed, which is a service which we offer from the ISA Square program and which is a service which we'll continue to offer from the DEP program. So uh, Costas, uh, off to you. Okay, so thank you, Peter. Uh, so my name is uh, Kostas uh, Simatos. I'm the team leader of the uh, interoperability testbed uh, service at, uh, at Digit. Um, so um, first of all, to start off uh, at a high level, what is the interoperability testbed? It is, uh, it is a service, it is a platform basically uh, that consists of software and hardware uh, on, the, on the cloud. Uh, that is offered as an online service that can be used uh, to uh, test IT systems for uh, conformance against specifications. Uh, here the focus specifically is on semantic and technical specifications, so we're really focusing on uh, real IT software that is being tested against the more, let's say, technical side of interoperability, semantic and technical specifications, and the, for and, and the focus is specifically on conformance testing, so we're not talking necessarily about functional testing, about performance testing, penetration testing, all these things are very important, but the focusing on interoperability. Uh, the goal overall for the for the platform, well, for all the services that we offer, uh, is that uh, these are intuitive uh, to users and they can actually be used in a self-service manner, both by the, administra uh, by the administrators that are setting up the, the whole testing strategy, but also by the users, the actual testers that um, proceed to, uh, to use them to, uh, to do testing. Uh, as Peter mentioned before, it's a service that is powered by Digit that will continue into the uh, DEP program. And one last point, which I think is interesting to mention, is that this is the closest thing that we have to a standards-based uh, solution about on conformance testing. Uh, specifically, we're based on the work from SEN on the uh, GATB uh, SEN workshop agreement, uh, which uh, puts in place the architecture services and different specifications that um, uh, conformance testing platform should uh, should offer to be able to be interoperable with other conformance testing solutions. So um, now, as I said, uh, the uh, the focus is on uh, conformance testing specifically, and this is a part of interoperability testing. And uh, the services that we offer can be used uh, to to such effect in a variety of use cases. So we can start from uh, something as simple as data validation, applying also quality control, using component services to test uh, data. But if uh, testing conformance to specification requires something more elaborate, this is something that is definitely possible. It's something that we, uh, that we, uh, that we of course support. Uh, this could range from, uh, from simulating service APIs to uh, test the message exchanges. Uh, and these could be simple exchanges where we validate the content that is being sent back and forth between uh, systems or it could even be a multi-step, um, uh, well, basically message exchange protocols where you expect uh, requests to correspond to responses and so on and so forth, and you want to validate complete uh, conversations between, uh, between peer systems. Now, uh, the different services that we offer, as I said, they're uh, largely based on, on, on a self-service self -service model. I think this is, a, this is a key point because we do not want users or uh, administrators or projects to always be involving well, either the project's administration or support help desk and so forth. So really it's a service that you can use yourself as you go along. And uh, depending on what is the service that is used, we have adapted uh, quite rich uh, reporting of test results. We offer a monitoring of, uh, of, uh, of the progress of testing. 
uh, and if needed in the um, for the specific scenario, uh, even also conformance certificates to show that this specific uh, solution, for example, conforms to a given specification. The uh, the key services that we offer, and these are the services that are the most, let's say, user uh, oriented, user accessible, are uh, content validators uh, that we'll talk a lot about today, and for which we also have uh, guest speakers from uh, Flanders and Germany, and uh, also what we call the complete uh, testbed solution. So uh, these uh, address two different sides of the same story, right? So uh, content validators they focus on data validation. So here, uh, these are uh, standalone services. Uh, they're basically web applications uh, that are used to receive uh, data via several input channels. It could be user provided, it could be via machine to machine API, for example, uh, and uh, validate this, uh, this data, producing various uh, reporting outputs. So you can have human readable reports, you can have machine readable reports, and so on and so forth. Uh, one thing that is very important with regards to validators is that these are completely anonymous in their usage and completely stateless. So validators never record who is testing, with what data they're testing, uh, what has been sent for validation, what are the different validation reports that are produced. Everything is completely uh, stateless. And this is important because we know that uh, such tools, they, they could also be sensitive in nature, right? You don't want to, let's say, use them to publish any kind of testing activity. Uh, also importantly, validators are configuration driven. So I'm going to try and show through this webinar that the key focus is on providing configuration for the validator. So you never have to, let's say, code anything, set, uh, do any some sort of elaborate uh, setup. You just need to provide quite intuitive, as we see it, configuration. And uh, this is all that is needed to get the validator um, up and running. Uh, on the other side, we have the complete test with platform. And here the focus is uh, conformance testing as a larger, let's say, at a larger scope. Uh, so here, um, the focus is really on uh, uh, testing IT solutions, as I said, through test cases that capture business level scenarios. So we don't want to have, let's say, kind of contextless test sessions. We want to always make sure that the test scenarios, they have a specific starting point, specific data with which you expect it to test and specific output that is expected to be produced. And all of this is, is validated through the, um, uh, the, uh, the test bed. Uh, in contrast also to validators here, uh, access to the test bed is always account based. So we have users all have specific accounts which are connected to the, to the test bed. Uh, and, uh, and here, anything that is done in terms of activity on the test bed is, uh, is captured, it's recorded, it's logged. Uh, in order to enable uh, the monitoring and reporting that is needed, both for the testers to want, that want to verify their testing progress, but also by the administrators of the different projects, the communities as we call them, that want to monitor the overall conformance uh, status of their community, of their user community. Uh, and here, as I'll show also later, the testbed that basically has it has quite a lot of built-in capabilities to uh, to achieve uh, quite a few. Uh, different te uh, technical steps, but one of its key features is its uh, extensibility. So on the fly, the testbed, uh, if we need to do something that it does not natively support, be it validation, processing, or let's say engage in a message exchange protocol that is not uh, supported, all of this can be extended uh, on the fly with, um, with custom test services. But I'm going to go more into this uh, later on. Now, um, regarding these two uh, types of services, validators and the complete testbed, it is important to highlight that we have two uh, distinct usage models that are both quite flexible. Uh, one is to use these as services on the cloud. So these are uh, multi-tenant services that are running uh, on the cloud and operated by digit, um, where uh, users do not need to worry about setting up uh, validators, setting up components, all they need to do is provide the configuration for either their validator or their full conformance testing uh, strategy if we're talking about using the, uh, the testbed. Um, in all cases, the setup per project or community is always distinct, so everything is kept uh, separate, and users are always in control of their own configurations. For example, if you're running a validator on um, a digit hosted uh, validator service, uh, and, you're, and you're validating your own, your own specification, updates that you make to, that the user makes to this configuration will be automatically taken into account and published as part of the online service. So this is a key point. Uh, the, 
operation, hosting, etc. This is managed by Digit, but you still maintain control over the, uh, the resulting services. Uh, now, the other side to this, the other option, is actually to go for on-premise installations, where all of the components that we offer as part of the cloud platform, they're also available as software components. Specifically, these are packaged as uh, Docker images. So, um, for those not familiar with Docker, it's, uh, it's a containerization technology, basically to simplify a lot uh, the, um, the installation, operation, and management of, uh, of services, of components. Uh, so all of this is, all, all these components are uh, captured as Docker images and they're published on the, uh, well, they're publicly available. And in this case, um, of course, the, uh, the hosting and operation of these components is, um, is done by users. Uh, so, uh, so here users have full control of uh, how uh, the different services are run. Um, and this could be actually the end to itself, having more operation control. But we usually see such setups when we want to impose, for example, specific access restrictions, if we want to make a service accessible only within a specific network, for example, or if we need to, uh, to integrate with internal services or resources that are not publicly available, that cannot be accessed from the, uh, from the cloud platform. So, um, Again, as a complement now to, uh, to what I've said, I'm not going to go into this, of course, a lot, but everything that, um, uh, that, we, uh, that I've talked about, that we are going to talk about, is fully documented um, online. So our documentation hub is in JoinUp, where we have access to all of the releases, news, etc. of the testbed, but we also have uh, quite a wealthy um, uh, set of online guides that range from uh, user and development guides to tutorials and focused uh, documentation sets. So there's references provided to all of these things as part of the slide deck that is going to be um, that is going to be uh, shared with you after the uh, the webinar completes. I would just ask, please, everyone, if uh, to just make sure that you mute yourself. Um, okay, cool, good. So um, coming back to the presentation. I'm going to go into now a bit further into uh, the first part, which is content validation and the use of uh, validators. So I'm going to briefly uh, talk about uh, some interesting use cases of validators. And uh, in general, validators, they're quite flexible. Um, so they can be used in any number of, of, of cases, but these are uh, typical scenarios that we see uh, users uh, applying them for or that we envision validators being used for. Uh, so one interesting first case is that validators can be used to complement a uh, specification, a semantic specification that is published uh, as a means of providing a tool to the community uh, around the specification. So often these specifications, they include a conformance uh, section that define different rules explaining uh, what is needed to conform to the specification. Well, actually expressing these rules as machine processable rules and providing them as actually as a usable service through a validator takes this to the next level, right? So you're publishing a specification and then next to it, you're also giving a tool to actually validate uh, content uh, against it. In this case, the focus is really on uh, uh, applying, well, making these rules that are defined as part of the specification machine processable and exposing them to uh, users so that they can use them. And validators that would be set up in this way are typically fully public. So anyone would access these validators as uh, they would also access the specification. Now, a second use case that we uh, that we are starting to see quite a lot, and for which we're going to also have a presentation from um, uh, from uh, Christian from the uh, the German Open Data Portal uh, about, is uh, use of validators in data ingestion processes as quality control components. So here, uh, what is the scenario uh, that uh, data is collected from various uh, sources, uh, from different data providers? And as part of this data ingestion process, we need to uh, potentially aggregate this data, we need to uh, convert it, potentially validate it. And uh, for the specific validation, this is where uh, validators come into, uh, come into play. So here, validation of the data that is coming in from different data providers is automated. So as part of this workflow that pulls in this data, there is also automated validation using the uh, validators machine-to-machine uh, -machine APIs. Uh, and the configuration of such validators is quite flexible because we see this because we need to, for example, integrate with internal systems such as triple stores, potentially databases and so forth. Uh, these kind of validators, we typically see them as being something internal, a private, 
um, uh, quality control component that is an integral but private part of this, uh, this data ingestion workflow. Uh, now, the, the third use case is uh, what we call production validation. And here, validators, uh, we see them as actually being used as uh, components uh, supporting uh, production service. So a service that needs to generate or uh, receive uh, data from other uh, services can use one or more validators to, uh, to ensure that this data is what is expected to be either generated or consumed. In this case, uh, we're talking pretty much always about not exposing the validators directly to users, but using them internally through their machine-to-machine -machine APIs. And as we're talking about production services, we typically see here uh, sets of validators that are defined as scalable deployments uh, or potentially set up in a high availability manner. So these are uh, points that are quite important for if, uh, services production level and it's quite critical. Having such components that can withstand load and can also um, ensure that they're constantly available is important. And this is something that validators support and for which we have also recently published a detailed um, production deployment guide for the validators to show how they can actually be set up in this, in this way. In terms of uh, syntax support, uh, so first of all, we have validators for various kinds of, of uh, specifications, but for these specific types of, let's say, syntaxes, uh, we have uh, an additional level of support, including automations, including uh, reuse of core components and so forth. So this is what I, I wanted to focus on today. Uh, these are really the validator services that you can just use out of the box and you're good to go. So we have uh, validators for the validation of RDF data, uh, where rules are captured as uh, shackle shapes. And these are the cases for which we're going to hear today from, uh, from Christian, uh, Bert and Dwight, that they're going to present the uh, use cases that we talked about from um, uh, member state public administrations. Uh, we also have uh, an XML validator that can validate XML data against uh, XML schema and schematron rules. Uh, CSV validator for the validation of CSV data against the table schema specifications. So this is a table schema. It's a part of the frictionless specifications, which is qu quite popular in defining the structure and business rules linked to CSV data. And also a JSON validator where we validate JSON based on one or more uh, JSON schema instances. And as I mentioned, uh, for each of these services, we have uh, multi-tenant instances on the cloud that are available to be uh, to be uh, simply reused by by users, and also for each of these we have uh, published uh, Docker images on the uh, the Docker Hub. So Docker Hub is the single point, let's say the public point where you would actually go and look up um, uh, public Docker images. Um, I'm not going to go into showing different guides and the different uh, Docker related stuff. Uh, if you're interested in this, you have all of the links provided here in the slide, so you can uh, look further into it. Now, I mentioned uh, quite a bit that uh, validators, they uh, focus on a configuration first approach. So I just wanted to very quickly just give you an idea what this configuration is about. And this is typically what the user of the validator is, a project that wants to use the validators, what they would need to provide. So the first part is really the validation artifacts that are linked to the specification. And here these depend on what is the kind of uh, syntax. Is it XML? Is it JSON? Is it, uh, is it RDF? And here we have the collection of artifacts that are used for the validation. Uh, in this case, I have an example here for XML data where we could have, let's say, structural, ru structural rules captured in a schema, the XSD file you see, and the uh, business rules that focus on content uh, captured in a schema trunk. Uh, now, to accompany uh, these, uh, we would provide also a configuration file that lists some simple configuration properties in terms of, let's say, what are the different channels that are exposed for validation? Should we have a web user interface? Should we have a machine to machine interface and so forth? And also we uh, define what are the different types of validation that are supported. So maybe you want different versions of one specification. Maybe you want multiple specifications to be supported. The idea here is that we define some metadata about these, such as labels to display and so forth, and also point to the actual artifacts that are going to be used for the validation. So this is really the set of configuration that needs to be provided for a given uh, validator. Now, having said all of this about validators, I'm going to quickly switch and make a very quick demo of a validator just to show you what such a validator looks like. And to do this, I'm going to use the, um, the public e-invoicing validator that is a validator published by the Connecting Europe facility, Ceph. 
which is offered as a tool to the community, but also this is used internally as part of their conformance testing uh, processes. So this is what the typical validator user interface looks like. So you have some, uh, let's say, information here on top that kind of positions you, gives you some extra context. Um, and here we have the option to provide the content to validate via uh, several means. In this case, you can either provide the files validate, validate via URI or provide, let's say, the input directly to the validator. This is an XML validator, by the way. So I'm going to here choose the file option, select an invoice in this case to, uh, to validate. And here I'm going to validate it against um, the uh, specification that I want. So that these are different um, uh, syntaxes to express electronic invoices, UBL and CII. And also we, all, we support also um, uh, credit notes. I'm just going to select here the option to validate, click on validate. And now what I see here as a result of the validator, I see here the uh, an overview which gives me uh, the overall uh, result, some counters, so many failures, so many successes, and here the uh, details on uh, the different failures that were incurred or warnings. And here I can see, actually, I can click on each of these to see in context what is the uh, point where I had this uh, failure, so I can get some nice information on this. I can see the full annotated input where I have all of the different failures listed uh, as part of the input that I just provided. Uh, you can also download here a PDF report of the validator, which I can show you here. It's basically what you see online, but in PDF. And also download an XML report. I'm not going to do this now, but this is a machine uh, processable report that gives you basically the same, uh, the same results. So this is the web user interface of a typical validator. And validators, as I said, also expose machine to machine APIs. And I can show you for the same validator, what it would look like to call it via uh, its machine to machine API. In this case, it's a SOAP web service API. So I have here an example that is prepared where I'm basically submitting the same invoice. I have it here. Let me just close this a bit. So I hope it's quite visible, uh, but the idea it's basically you provide a set of inputs. In this case, we have one XML input, which is the XML content directly. We're providing this as a string, but this could also be a URL. It could also be a byte stream. It could be provided in, 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 in different ways. And here we select also as the validation type UBL to make the validation of the invoice as a UBL invoice. So I click on send. This is the, uh, the SOAP endpoint of the uh, validation service. I click on send. And I get back the response, which is a uh, basically an XML report that gives me the same kind of information as we saw online. So uh, overview information. We see also here the uh, the invoice that was validated. I'm going to skip this. And also uh, a detailed listing of the errors, what came up, where actually the failures were encountered and, uh, and so on and so forth. So hopefully this gives you an idea of uh, how validators can be used from a user interface and machine to machine API. And now before I pass the floor to uh, the guest speakers from uh, Flanders and Germany to talk about their usage of validators, I just wanted to go just a little bit more into the uh, approaches that uh, can be followed to set up validators, just to give you an idea of how this can actually be uh, achieved. Uh, so as I said, the first step, uh, in this case, we have the approach of uh, setting up a validator on the uh, digit uh, cloud uh, platform as a, as a service. Uh, so the first step is define the configuration of the validator. This is what we saw before. It's basically uh, capturing the validation artifacts plus providing the simple configuration file that kind of adds context to the, uh, to the validation. So define this uh, configuration and then second step, provide it to the, uh, the testbed team. So here this validator configuration would just be shared to the testbed team. This could be done either, you could just share it directly or maybe put it, for example, on GitHub and share the link to the repository on GitHub. And in this case, the testbed team would set up this repository. If not already set up, they would create a repository. They would wire together everything that is needed to be wired together. And they would give you access to be able to update the configuration uh, from your side whenever you want uh, in a way that is going to automatically update the resulting uh, service. Uh, as soon as the configuration is in place, uh, the validator can be used either through uh, web uh, user interface for users, through machine to machine uh, integration, as we saw, uh, but also if it's been configured to do so, 
even as a command line tool. So you can download the version of the validator and use it in, let's say, scripting, for example, as a fully command line uh, tool. Now, the second approach of setting up uh, validators is, as I said, to use an on-premise setup. And here you'll see that it's quite similar to the first one. So the configuration is prepared. Uh, but in this case, as the second step, uh, instead of providing this configuration to the testbed, you, the user, would actually use one of the, well, the uh, base validator image that corresponds to the specific syntax. Uh, in this case, I have an example for the XML validator, in which you would uh, plug in the configuration and potentially provide some additional uh, properties that are linked to the specific uh, validator instance. For example, some credentials to access an internal triple, uh, triple store or something like that. So uh, once this has been set up on your premises, then here, again, you manage exactly how this is exposed, but in principle, uh, you have the same kind of uses that you can achieve through the uh, service. So it's usable by users, usable by machines, and also usable uh, in uh, scripts via a command line tool. Uh, for these uh, operational options, I'm not going to go too much into this. Uh, just to note that uh, when um, we're setting up a validator as a service uh, on the uh, digit uh, hosted uh, public validator instances, uh, we have two options basically. Uh, and I wanted to talk about the first option that I list here because it's one that we uh, start seeing quite a bit, where um, we can have a, a family of specifications that are linked or uh, a core specification, for example, an EU level specification uh, that uh, is foreseen to be extended or customized by additional by 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 uh, by, by other parties. And this example for, uh, let's say, uh, by member states. So you could have an EU specification with uh, also supported national extensions. In this case, we have an interesting option where we could go for a validator that is hosted on the testbed, but that has a shared governance of all of this configuration. So it's a shared validator instance with shared governance, but actually multiple configurations bund bundled into the same validator. Um, another option, of course, is to not go for this shared governance and to go for a, a standalone uh, setup but still on the uh, hosted on the testbed, so hosted and operated by digit, uh, where the validator, it is, uh, it is basically dedicated to a specific user. And this is the case that we're going to see also um, from the uh, German Open Data Portal. And we're going to have Christian that is going to talk to us about this afterwards. Uh, and the third option, uh, basically this is the on-premise option, where uh, the validator is completely standalone. There is only your configuration in it. And of course, you manage it completely as hosted on your own uh, infrastructure. Now, just to illustrate these three options and to also give a nice introduction to, um, to our uh, speakers from uh, Flanders and Germany, I wanted to show you uh, these three uh, options, what they actually look like uh, by showing you online validators that actually apply them. I'm not going to actually use the validators. It's really just showing you what these would actually uh, look like if, if set up as such. So I'm going to go back to my demo and show you the first option here uh, of a validator that is actually used uh, with uh, shared governance to group together multiple different uh, specifications that extend a common EU level specification. And this, of course, uh, the example is EU level, but it could also, of course, be applied to a national specification that, for example, needs to be extended in different regions or so on and so forth. Uh, so here, this is a proof of concept validator for public service data. Uh, here we can extend and provide any kind of context information about this. We can also um, go for uh, detailed descriptions, for example, on how things are spe expected to be extended, what are the different rules that apply per, per member state, for example. All of this is part of the validator's configuration. Uh, here, uh, again, you provide the content to validate, as we, as we saw before, by, via different approaches. Uh, and here we select uh, specifications, so we have here certain let's say common EU level specifications that are configured. I have here CPSV AP, which is about the public service, uh, public service metadata, uh, for example. And here we have extensions where uh, these, I mean, what these extensions are, it's quite uh, flexible. It could be versions of a specification, for example, but here uh, we uh, consider these are really national customizations of this core specification. So here you could actually have for example, the uh, different um, extensions for uh, different uh, member states uh, building over this common specification. Uh, so, uh, so with this, you can actually, uh, in one validator, uh, either have the core specification you want to test against or any extension that you choose from. 
And I also wanted to show here another interesting option. You could even have uh, an option which is, we term it, let's say, a development sandbox, where you can choose a specification that you want to, uh, to build upon, let's say here again, CPSVAP. And here you actually expect it to provide uh, on the fly additional um, validation artifacts that are specific to your uh, national extensions. The whole, I mean, why is this a development sandbox? Because the idea here is that um, maybe uh, you have a semantic experts that are developing these specifications, you want to test them online. Um, you could actually use this uh, tool to actually, this approach to actually um, drive the validation, extending this core specification using um, additional artifacts provided as part of the input of the validator. So this is one example, as I said, of a kind of a validator with a shared uh, governance model. Uh, the second example, it's a validator hosted on, hosted on the testbed, but it is specific to uh, a given user. And here it's a DKTPDE validator. Not going to go into a lot here because Christian is going to talk to us about this uh, shortly. Um, just from the side of the testbed, what I wanted to highlight is that you see here, this is a configuration done by a member state public administration. Uh, a validator that is fully customized. You have, uh, okay, it's in German. You have uh, links to different specifications, different references, and you have here the listing of uh, the different um, uh, conformance profiles that are expected, the different specifications that are uh, uh, provided for validation through this uh, through this validator. Now, as a third example, and here we're going for the third option, which was the uh, on-premise uh, setup. This is where I just wanted to briefly highlight the Oslo validator, and this is a validator that uh, Bert and Dwight are going to talk, uh, talk to us just after. Um, and here, uh, this validator, again, from the testbed's perspective, it's interesting because, um, uh, so the Flemish government is actually running an internal validator instance on their own infrastructure, and this is integrated with their front-end portal by means of its machine-to-machine -machine API. So this, um, uh, this user interface, it is a separate user interface that is that aligns to the, um, uh, well, the requirements that are in place, style, et cetera, requirements, theming requirements that are in place. Uh, and the different choices that are made here in terms of the different conformance profiles, the different validation options and so forth, linked to the Oslo standards, uh, these are then uh, passed uh, to the validator to do the actual internal validation before uh, returning the results and displaying them here on the um, on the on the Flemish uh, portal, basically. So, uh, with these examples, I hope that I covered and I showed you a bit what such different options uh, look like in terms of how validators can be uh, set up and operated. And with this, I'm going to now um, pass the floor to uh, Bert and Dwight from the uh, Flemish Information Agency to talk a bit more about uh, Oslo. So, Bert and Dwight, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Kostas. I'll upload the presentation. Okay, so in the meantime, so thank you. Um, so, I'm Bert van Luffelen and uh, my colleague is Dwight van Lanker, and we work for the Flemish agency Digital Vlaanderen, who is responsible for um, uh, yeah, the Oslo program, as you, some of you already might have heard about. We shortly will introduce it, uh, why it's important, uh, because the setting of the, uh, the testbed validator, how we use it, is strongly connected with the objectives that we have as the program. Um, and so we will first introduce the program and then go to the, uh, the setting of the, uh, the usage of the validator. As Peter already introduced uh, in the beginning of, of, of the webinar, uh, the interoperability framework is, is actually at the core of the Oslo program. It's actually, it's the Oslo forms kind of an instance of this, but more even the whole organization, Digital Flanders, is kind of tackling all the layers uh, and uh, aspects uh, of that and has set up a governance structure in which all those interoperability challenges are being tackled. Um, the similar uh, approach, and, and it is arising in, in, the, in Belgium at the federal, at the interfederal level, it's called the ISEG. Um, so it's a similar structure that is being uh, created, an approach where the regions are collaborating with the federal level in Belgium. Um, <clears throat> so what is key for Oslo as such as the program, uh, as the Oslo program, it actually starts from 
the interoperability challenge, which is uh, on the semantical level. So all the others uh, are important, but let's say Oslo starts from the challenge how to agree on the common terms and then go uh, towards uh, first technical interoperability, but as well organizational and uh, legal interoperability. And all those aspects uh, played in a role, but they are initiated from this semantical perspective. And in that program in Oslo, we, we essentially work around creating and co-creating with all the stakeholders. Uh, and this is uh, not only the government bodies, but everybody who would like to participate in this uh, design of a vocabulary or an application profile uh, to create a common understanding of uh, terminology. Uh, we make a distinction between vocabularies, which are just a collection of terms, and uh, application profiles and even further on implementation models, which are actually structured, organized usages of those vocabularies. And it's in the context of those application profiles that uh, the validation plays a role. Um, so the vocabularies are free to use. You can combine and organize them in the ways according to the semantics of the terms but application profiles focus in the context of a generic application on how to use those terms. And we have uh, procedures and methods how to uh, connect those things. And the key element in that story is uh, that we base this on the semantic web. So our terms have persistent identifiers. These are dereferenceable so that users, if they use these terms, can find easily what is the semantics of it. And then if we want to validate or want to see if the, uh, the data is conformant, then we have a mean, a, a method, how to express the actual data. And this is based in the semantic uh, web context uh, in the RDF format. And that is then being used uh, by the uh, testbed uh, validator instance that we have set up. OK, right. Thanks, Bert. So um, Bert already mentioned the, the vocabularies and the application profiles that we create in order to raise the semantic interoperability. And to create these data standards, we have a method, and that method is called the Oslo toolchain. And it all starts by creating the data model. So we create the data model as a UML model, and then that model is stored in a GitHub repository. For each domain in which we develop data standards, we create a separate uh, GitHub repository, and we consider these GitHub repositories as the single source of truth for our data standards. Then through an automated process, the information in these repositories is used to create specifications. So we create an HTML page so that humans can read uh, our vocabularies and our application profiles. We create an RDF specification so that machines can read it. We also generate a JSON-LD context file that allows developers to only, so that they only have to include the link of that context file in their JSON-LD data, and then they can start implementing the data model. And we also generate a shackle file, so the technical contract to check the compliance with the data standard. And it's actually uh, these shackle files that we use in our RDF validator, or which or who we call it, uh, the Oslo validator. And the Oslo validator uh, contains two components. The first one is a Flemish styled front end that we created with the Vue.js framework and Costas already demoed it. And the second component is the ITP RDF validator that we use as a backend. And as Costas already mentioned it, we host it on our own environment. So we host them as separate Docker containers um, and we enabled the REST API of the ITP RDF validator so that we can make calls to it from our front end. The main reason for us to make the switch to the ITB RDF validator is maintenance. Um, Bert and I didn't always have the time to maintain and update our old validator. So when Costas told, told us about the ISA testbed and the RDF validator, we were happy to adopt it because we, we also knew that, that there's a team working on it, updating it, maintaining it, adding, adding nice features to it and well, um, adopting uh, to the IT, ITP RDF validator uh, saved us a lot of time already. Another reason for us to well adopt to the adopt the ITB RDF 
validator is because we are developing a conformance framework for Oslo. So that framework is actually a document that lets, that lets you check whether or not you are compliant with, of, uh, with our da Oslo data standards. And one of the conditions in that document is that a machine must be able to verify if your data is uh, compliant with one or more Oslo data standards. And for that use case, we use the Oslo validator. So um, by switching to the uh, ITB RDF validator, we ensure that we can work with a stable application. We already made quite some progress, um, but we are we still have some things left to do. Um, at this moment, we have to manually configure the configuration file of our backend. So when we want to add a new uh, data standard or the Shackle file of a new data standard, we have to manually add it to that configuration file. And in the future, we want to do this automatically. So when our tool chain is ready, creating the specifications of a new data standard, that Shackle file should be automatically added to the configuration file. Our idea is to do that through GitHub Actions, but we're free to we're also open to to other suggestions as well. So that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, I think there's a Q and A later in this webinar. Uh, but don't hesitate to send us an email as well, and we'll be we'll be happy to answer it. For now, I'll uh, pass the floor back to Costas. Okay, thank you, Bert and Dwight. I'm just grabbing again the presentation. And uh, at this point, uh, I would like to invite now, let me just skip to the next one. So uh, yes, at this point, I'd like uh, now to invite uh, Christian from the uh, German Open Data uh, Portal to, um, to now take the floor and also now talk about the DCAT APD uh, validator. So Christian, the floor is, uh, is yours. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. I work at uh, Gaff Data, the German Federal uh, Open Data Portal, uh, together with my supervisor Christian and my colleague Anja. We are a small team and we are running the Open Data Portal and we are also responsible for uh, DKA PDE, so the German uh, Open Metadata Standard. And yeah, today, as Cos uh, has already mentioned, I uh, will give you a short insight in our validation use case, or uh, in other words, uh, our attempt to improve the quality of open metadata. That's our main goal, what we want to achieve with that. Um, yeah, first, a uh, slightly introduction in DKA PDE. So this is uh, our mandatory to use uh, metadata standard in Germany, and it's 100% compliant with the European standard DKAP and it's also an RDF standard uh, and based on linked open data principles. So we're using URIs and the data that are serialized in the graph. And yeah, I uh, just uh, gave you the link to uh, our uh, further information. Unfortunately, it's only in German as uh, most of the things coming out of Germany. Um, but uh, I will recommend you to, if you're interested in a, a metadata standard, just uh, go for the DCAT AP for the European version and you get uh, um, a lot of documentation out of it. So, our first uh, uh, use case here you can see on the left, the cost has already represented this, is our um, ITP RDF uh, validator, the community tool. And our main use case is to support new DKAP CE adapters. For example, new open data portals coming up and have to deal with a DKAP DE. They um, uh, are uh, yeah, supported now by uh, the validator to check their data to, uh, to get DKAP DE ready. So before the validator, we had our specification document, we had implementation guidelines, we have um, example files, but uh, we have, it was always uh, a lot of work. So we had to, to test, to check, to do partly manual uh, tests and to check data from new data providers to verify and to, to ensure that the, they are compliant with the specification. 
And right now we are able to uh, share the link to our uh, online validator just to new adopters and um, which really is a great help for us and also for the new uh, adopters. So uh, it will save us a lot of money. Um, yeah, as you can uh, see uh, on the left, uh, we have uh, different uh, profiles for different use cases. So you can test, uh, for example, is, is my data compliant to the specification or does it also, is it also compliant to the added implementation rules where we have at our gov data portal? So we have a special implementation guidelines uh, if you want, when you are want to be harvested by our portal. And so there are different use cases and therefore we have different profiles. Um, yeah, our first experience uh, as Klaus has already mentioned, it was really, uh, uh, I just can repeat it, uh, really easy to set up. So there was a great documentation and also cost us, helped us with several uh, little uh, problems with quick fixes, customizations, just uh, uh, put the, the upload limit up and stuff like that. So this was really a great help for the, um, um, for the setup. Um, what you want to achieve uh, in the future with this um, uh, validator is um, to find a solution to aggregate or sort the error messages. So in, in our use case, when our data suppliers are, are validating their data, it's, uh, it's not, it often happens that they get like hundreds or thousands of uh, violation messages. So, and, um, uh, we often saw that the users are like kind of overwhelmed by this large report and they, yeah, they kind of uh, lose the motivation to tackle the problem. So if they first like, they, oh God, oh my God, there are 2000 uh, violations. Uh, okay. Um, and then we want to tackle the problem and then like some, some, yeah, to, to, to find a solution, how to aggregate or sort the error messages to get it, like, uh, get the people a better overview and from the different uh, violations. So that's our standalone uh, community version. And another uh, solution where we, um, another use case is um, we set up a local version uh, and we generated a dashboard out of it. So now you can ask, okay, you have a validator via dashboard. Uh, are you a fan of dashboard? Uh, no, it's not, uh, I'm not a fan of the highlighting showy dashboard. It's more like we wanted to um, make um, the important quality criteria visible and also to create incentives to improve the metadata quality direct in our portal. So when we uh, discussed with users and we, we looked at some reports, they uh, always say like, okay, for example, spatial, um, uh, spatial properties are really highly recommended uh, from users and stuff like that. And we wanted to keep our data providers to pay attention on it and to improve the data, their metadata at this specific point. So, Therefore, we uh, run a local version of the uh, ITB RDF validator and um, set up a, a, a pipeline with uh, including the shackle validation, also sparkling queries. And I will show it to you uh, on the next page, a short uh, picture out of it. And yeah, also here, um, there was a, um, a great support. Um, we had like, um, but yeah, we have uh, a GAF data, only a small a team, as I mentioned, and a really small budget. And it just uh, was um, good work uh, because we had like a really a good team working together. For example, my colleague Antje always uh, pushed great ideas how to set up the pipeline. We had our uh, data um, technical provider, Mr. Nürnberg from Seitenbau, who made the local implementation uh, really uh, quick and smooth. And we also had support from a freelancer 
at this time when Benjamin Degenhardt, who designed us sparkling queries, and we have another technical uh, uh, supplier, Mr. Rinsha from Init, who created the Shekel files. And again, a great support from Costas, who helped us with several problems in setting up the validators. And uh, with this uh, teamwork, uh, it, it was only possible with our uh, small uh, budget and uh, amount of time to, to set up this um, pipeline and to generate this uh, dashboard and the local validator. So, um, yeah, here in the future, uh, we want to um, enhance the assistance for the um, data suppliers. We don't want to end in, here's the dashboard, your uh, data looks like crap or it's fine. Of course, we want to um, assist the um, data suppliers in, in the improvement of their metadata. So oh, here is a quick overview of our, um, yeah, we, we call it the, the, the dashboard pipeline. So um, at GovData, we have like uh, 16 uh, sources where we are harvesting. And also it's like, uh, right now we have like, I think 54 and 45,000 uh, of metadata sets roundabout. And uh, our portal is a seeking portal, but um, we, uh, we uh, uh, um, implemented a, a Apache Yena for CQ triple store next to it. So we, um, there we uh, import the uh, REF metadata when we are uh, harvesting our uh, portals and uh, store the data that's uh, in a graph in the triple store. So, and every time when um, the uh, a graph is a dataset graph is um, updated, um, it's it's gonna be violated, not violated, validated uh, in the uh, ITB RDF validator automatically. So, and then when it's validated, we store the validation result also as a graph in the triple store, like a validation report graph. Um, and we are using uh, Sparkle queries to uh, feed the validator and to enrich the um, validation result in the um, triple store. So, and once a day, so this is immediately uh, after importing the data, the validation process. And once a day, we are uh, counting and storing the validation result. Um, for the dashboard uh, in insert index, we, uh, we use uh, Elasticsearch. And uh, out of this, we generate the dashboard. So it's updated once a day. Um, yeah, as I already mentioned, this, this pipeline works very well. But um, right now, we are just uh, at the beginning. So we just have a few. Um, a few um, quality criteria, and uh, we want to, um, yeah, want to, uh, of course, uh, um, have more in the future. And yeah, to, to sum up, uh, I, I just uh, raised at the beginning the question how to improve the quality of metadata. Um, I think we have a, a lot of work to do until uh, the metadata really gets a bigger um, on the next level. Um, I think we can uh, focus our goals on, we want to make the troubleshooting less complicated. That's uh, things I mentioned uh, when, uh, yeah, aggregating the error messages, for example, or also giving advices for problem solving uh, when you have a validation problems. Another point is we want to create more awareness for the metadata quality. So we wanted to make the dashboard available and promote it. That really people look at it and say, oh, wow, my data is crap. I have to do with it. Or also um, we want to offer webinars uh, on the validator or dashboard to promote it and just to, to get people know of it because um, uh, because that is a great chance for us here. Uh, the invitation from Gus is to 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 um, yeah to talk about. It. I mean, all of you guys, you know how uh, important metadata quality is, and 
we have to uh, uh, tell it other people again and again um, and make awareness of it, how, how big it is. And yeah, in the end, we want to um, yeah, show how to benefit from with metadata quality, for example, for some use cases and stuff out of it. So yeah, to sum up, um, the validation uh, works brilliant. And I uh, also a lot of thanks to, to Costas and his team, so the ITB initiative, but um, yeah. We are, uh, um, there are several steps to go for us. Um, yeah, that's from my side. Thanks. Okay, thank you, okay, uh, Chris. Thank you, uh, thank you also for the, uh, for the kind words. Uh, I'm going to grab the presentation uh, back. Okay, so um, so we're a few minutes uh, over what we expected, but uh, we had a QA session planned uh, for uh, for now, uh, focusing on the data validation and potentially asking uh, questions to um, to Christian, Bert, and uh, Dwight. Um, we could limit this a bit now. Uh, um, keep in mind there is another QA session at the end of the webinar, so uh, up to you. If you have any questions up to now, uh, please. Uh, uh, feel free to to ask. Otherwise, as I said, we have the um, the QA session uh, to close the webinar at the end as well. So, does anyone have any um, any points to share? Any questions up to this up to this point? Just giving a few seconds. Okay. Thanks, Carl Marcus, for confirming. Okay, good. So, um, so yes, if uh, something does come up, just uh, as I said, feel free to um, to keep your question for the uh, the uh, uh, well the final QA session that we're going to have. And in the meantime, I'm going to uh, proceed with the second part, which was of the webinar, which was focusing on conformance testing, and specifically the um, uh, what we call it the complete uh, test uh, platform. So uh, to start off, I'm going to uh, to give you some idea of how this uh, conformance testing platform could be used through uh, some uh, typical use cases. And again, these use cases, they're drawn from what we see uh, from our user communities using the test before. And I think it actually uh, gives you some nice indication of how it could potentially be used uh, for other use cases and potentially for your own uh, different uh, needs. Um, so one interesting case is the first one I have here in the slide, which is, uh, as a that, that the testlet can be used as a community support uh, tool. So here the idea is that um, we, we have one or more specifications, potentially a family of, speci of uh, specifications that is uh, defined, and we're using the testbed to actually uh, complement it with demonstration scenarios. Um, here the, uh, the test cases that are defined, they're not exactly meant for uh, conformance testing, but they're actually meant to, uh, to illustrate how these specifications could be used in order to get their respective jobs done, basically. Um, so really show how, let's say, messages are being exchanged, what is the kind of data that is sent and received in typical scenarios. And again, this is purely focusing on uh, raising awareness and demonstrating how the specs could be, uh, could be used. Additionally, we could also have test cases as utilities. So for example, if we want to expose validation, some processing, some aggregation functions, something like that, um, this scenario could also include uh, such test cases really as tools that are provided to the community rather than something focused strictly on conformance testing. In this case, the focus is really offering this as a public service, so the community in the testbed would be public, and the focus is really on uh, making examples executable and really adding a lot of documentation to highlight how the different specifications can be used. Now, the second use case I have here is peer certification, and this is uh, this is uh, what uh, most of our users actually use the, uh, the, the testbed uh, for. Uh, and it's uh, it's to uh, to basically certify that IT systems, peer IT systems, uh, actually conform to a specification before joining uh, production. Um, so uh, what is the what is the, the case here? Um, imagine we have uh, let's say a project uh, that uh, spans uh, countries across border project. Uh, we have different nodes that are expected to be uh, exchanging messages between member states. This could be also at the national level, for example, with different implementations, different nodes exchanging data between regions, uh, for example. Uh, and in this case, we want to make sure that each of these individual nodes, before they actually join the exchange of messages in production, 
they actually have tested for conformance to the specifications. And here, the, uh, the test scenarios to do this are typically quite extensive. So we have uh, potentially hundreds of test cases that include all sorts of different scenarios, both testing uh, valid cases, valid exchanges, invalid exchanges, unexpected situations, all different aspects of the involved specifications and so forth. They're really, the focus is on having as much co uh, coverage as possible. We also have things such as uh, specification versioning, where you could, for example, target a specific version of a specification if this is supported. Uh, and in this case, the, the community in question, because the different counterparts of the testing are typically known in advance, the community is typically private. So it's, it's a community that, either, that is either set up on a private tested instance, so one that is not publicly available, or it is a community that is invitation only. So the administrators would invite users, which would be the uh, testing coordinators, for example, from the, from the different parties involved, to connect to the test bed in which they could plug in their systems and start uh, testing. Now, the third use case I have here, this is another one that we see uh, quite a bit. Um, we see a lot with the Connecting Europe facility, uh, which is the uh, support to uh, grant application processes. So here the idea is that there is a specification in place, uh, but there is also a grant procedure in place. So if you're, let's say, an industry provider, a uh, solution provider, uh, that is building a solution in line with these specifications, uh, there may be um, uh, funding uh, that is available, but you have to prove that you have provided a, um, uh, a conformant implementation. So in this case, uh, the use of the test bed is to allow such service providers to connect uh, and to demonstrate via a series of test cases that they actually, their capabilities conform to the specs and they can claim the, uh, well, the funding in question. Here, um, the parties are not typically known in advance. So what we have is, uh, usually self-registration supported through the testbed, where different parties can connect to the testbed instance that houses basically all of this uh, conformance testing setup. They self-register, and as part of this, they actually provide the information to identify them, specify in this specific country for uh, this, well, this specific uh, provider, uh, VAT numbers, uh, different numbers linked to the grant processes, anything that would be needed and potentially as a result of this, uh, extract conformance certificates that can then be used as proof of uh, conformance to the underlying specifications. Now, um, I'm not going to spend time on this a lot because I think I already covered how validators differ from the uh, complete testbed platform. Uh, I think just to summarize again, the, the testbed's focus here is really on any kind of um, test cases that are needed to prove conformance. So these could involve data validation, but they could also exchange, uh, extend to exchanging messages. This is typically the case, actually. Exchanging messages between uh, peer systems. Um, it could be uh, business processes, uh, testing that different steps of a business process are followed, the different messages are exchanged when they're expected to be exchanged, and so forth. Um, now, here, there is always a context involved because we have specific test scenarios. So we don't, let's say, um, just ask uh, a user or an IT system to send any data, and if it validates, it's good. Uh, but here we have specific scenarios. So we prepare specific inputs through test uh, suites. Uh, we expect specific answers tailored to these inputs. We expect the correct sequence of messages and so forth. Uh, so this is, these are really things to challenge the, uh, the solution being tested to ensure that it uh, conforms. And of course here, everything that is done is not anonymous. It's all tracked. You have authenticated users that are connecting and testing with their uh, configured systems. Finally, on the, uh, on the point of output, uh, here, uh, we record all of the results on the testbed. It's not just a validation report that validators produce, but it's really a full recording of all of the testing uh, steps, all of the data exchanged, all of the results, in order to be able to uh, facilitate the subsequent monitoring and also uh, reporting. As I said, both for the testers testing, but also for the administrators that are following up on the uh, conformance testing uh, progress of the community. Uh, now, one interesting point is that validators in this process, they're actually conformance testing building blocks. So this is something that we see quite a lot. So, for example, if we have test cases in the testbed that expect um, uh, a provider to send data to a, a receiver, for example, um, and we expect this data to be valid, in this case, we would be using a validator if it's available, integrating with it and validating the, uh, the data that is exchanged. And also, of course, extending this by uh, potentially adding additional rules based on the specific scenario in question. So I think uh, here I just wanted to summarize that it's they're not the same thing, validators and the testbed for conformance testing, 
uh, but also it's uh, they're complementary and typically a stepped process. Start with validation and then use validation as a tool for conformance testing. Now, here again, I'm going to uh, skip the, the details. Uh, I think uh, what I just want to highlight here is that the testbed uh, defines certain concepts for the management of specifications and for the management of a community. So the organizations, IT systems, users, etc., that are connecting, uh, that can be very flexible to adapt to a different uh, to each project's uh, requirements. Um, so we have things that can capture things like an organization, a specific IT system uh, that can capture a specification, different options of the, of the specification, and so forth. Um, all of these things can be managed by community administrators. Some of these things can also be hidden if they don't apply for a given community. If, for example, certain terms do not seem intuitive, they can be relabeled for a given community. For example, if a system is more like a service, we could rename all instances of, well, the administrator can specify that the system has actually turned the service and so on and so forth. What underlies all of this, which is also what you're going to see in, the, um, in a demo that I'm going to uh, go into shortly, is uh, the concept of a conformance statement. The conformance statement is the, um, the statement defined that a specific IT system conforms to a given specification and specifically a, spe a role in this specific uh, specification. And the whole testing goal is to execute the test cases that uh, constitute these uh, conformance statements. And in the end, if the you succeed, if the test succeed, uh, conformance is basically uh, established. Now, um, in terms of capabilities, uh, again, I'm not going to go into individual details here. Uh, I just want to note that the testbed itself is testing engine. It uh, includes a bunch of built-in support cap uh, for, for uh, numerous capabilities that address uh, most kinds of validations, um, different kinds of messaging that are involved, different protocols, different, uh, different uh, service API calls, etc and also different arbitrary processing steps, things like webhooks, using templates, signatures, and so forth. So, um, so basically there is a lot of uh, uh, built-in support in the testbed uh, but for different capabilities, but anything that is not there can also be um, provided as an extension to the testbed. This is something I mentioned in the beginning, that the testbed is really uh, fully extensible. And this is done by means of what you see on the right here, the uh, custom services. So we can define custom services for either processing messaging or validation that through use of common APIs, these APIs that are based on the uh, from the specifications upon which the, the, the testbed is based on, uh, they can be integrated on the fly as part of a test uh, uh, sessions execution. Uh, interestingly, also what you see here is custom validation service. This is where a validator, such as, for example, the DKTPD validator or the Oslo validator we talked about before, this could be plugged into any test case to validate content uh, because it, uh, it actually realizes the expected API for such extensions. In terms of how the testbed works, again, this is a very high level helicopter view, uh, but I think it's interesting just to highlight how the full platform works. Uh, so the testbed exposes a web user interface that is used both by the administrators of a given project, the community in the testbed, and also the testers. Uh, the administrator uses the interface to actually configure the test cases that are needed to establish conformance for the different specifications that are uh, supported. Uh, and these test cases, they are run by the test execution engine, which leverages, as I said, the built-in capabilities of the testbed, uh, but where these are not um, uh, sufficient, uh, also leverages uh, different custom extensions that can be domain-specific extensions and so forth uh, to do things like validation processing and messaging. Uh, what you see at the bottom right, uh, the reference system, this is an interesting point uh, because as part of the overall conformance testing setup, um, we can also plug into uh, real actual systems um, that are used, let's say, internally by the testbed to carry out uh, complex steps. For example, if we have uh, some complex messaging, uh, let's say, architecture and we have access points, gateway, gateways and so forth that are used, the testbed can actually tap into one of these gateways uh, to actually carry out messaging that is needed in a given pro project, for example. Now, from the side of the tester, things are uh, more simple. The tester accesses the same web user interface, um, uh, connects, uh, selects the test cases to run, and these are then uh, ran and uh, test the actual system on the test, so the actual IT system that uh, engages in message exchanges either directly with the test execution engine or potentially with one of these uh, custom messaging 
uh, services that I that I mentioned before. Now, so this I, ha I hope this gives a, a, a brief overview of how the full testbed platform works. And at this point, I would like to switch to do a quick uh, demo to show you what it actually looks like. So this this here is the uh, it's the testbed platform that is hosted by uh, Digit. So this is the shared service that is provided by by Digit. Uh, before I go into uh, actually uh, the demo, I just wanted to highlight that you see this is a commission themed um, instance of the testbed. It's normal as it's it's a, it's a commission offered service. Uh, but this is something flexible. We have uh, there is also a non-branded version of the test that it can be used because not everyone, of course, if you're not working with the commission, you don't want to show commission logos everywhere. Uh, but also we're going to be releasing shortly uh, theming capabilities where you can actually customize the test bed, different colors, color schemes, uh, logos that are displayed and so forth. So um, if uh, let's say we have something specific like what we saw in the case of the Oslo validator and the Flemish, let's say, look and feel, this could be applied directly to the testbed itself if you want to have a, a Flemish, let's say, conformance testing portal based on this. Now, proceeding with the uh, demo, I'm going to, I prepared for the demo uh, a scenario and a, and a public demo community but I'm, that is publicly accessible. I'm going to click here on the register uh, link. I'm, I'm running the case where I am uh, basically a new user uh, and I'm going to connect now, register for the first time and proceed to do my first tests. So I'm going to click here the register link. I'm being authenticated and once authenticated, I see here the list of uh, available public communities on the testbed. There are many more available, of course, internally, but these are private ones that are more invitation only. Uh, these are ones that are accessibly uh, that are accessible uh, publicly. Uh, and here I have the case that I want to show you today, a demo community. Again, this is just a set of test cases that I put together for the demo. I'm going to select it. I need to provide here a registration token. This is something optional. Uh, if you want to have something offered, uh, let's say publicly, but so that not anyone can connect. Uh, and in this case, I have a little token in place that I need to put. So I think it's just demo. Uh, and I define here the details of my organization. So I'm just call, going to call this. Uh, so I was just completing the information here. Uh, so I give uh, basically some uh, short information that is requested that could also be custom information that is needed here by the uh, administrator. Um, uh, and as part of the uh, what is requested for me in the uh, registration page, uh, the administrator has also um, prepared uh, configurations that are available for me to select as the first uh, step. This is something optional. It could also be required. Uh, but here um, there are uh, already, let's say, cura curated versions of uh, what I'm expected to test for uh, conformance. Uh, here I have two options, electronic invoicing and electronic invoicing and service metadata exchange. I'm going to select this one to proceed and click on complete. So now I've registered. Uh, I have a role here that is linked to my account, which is what you see here. And here I'm going to, I'm uh, accessing now the welcome page of the, uh, the testbed community that I just registered for. I have a welcome message. This is something that can be fully customized by the administrators. You can provide context information, links, references, and so forth. Uh, and to proceed with the testing, what I'm going to do, I'm going to click on tests. I see here a system that is already created for me as a placeholder for my actual IT system uh, to, to test the conformance for. I'm going to select it. And I see here the conformance statements. So this is what I had mentioned before, uh, the, uh, the statements that link my IT system with the actual specifications that I'm going to uh, test for. This is already pre-wired for me as part of the self-registration process. And uh, I see here the status. I have uh, currently no tests executed, so I don't, have, um, uh, I don't have any results yet. I'm going to run a first case where I do some, uh, an electronic invoicing case. Uh, so here I see the details of the conformance statement. So again, what am I testing for? What is the purpose, et cetera, et cetera. The list of test cases. Uh, in this case, it's just one. It's just a simple demo, but it could be actually any number. We could have a, a, a full test suite, multiple test suites with potentially dozens of test cases. And I can see here also some additional context information that is provided uh, to me by the um, as part of the definition of the test case that gives me some instructions on how to, uh, to actually proceed with the test. I'm going to click on the play button to proceed. 
And now the uh, test session is being prepared. And what I see here is a diagram description of the, um, of the test case that's going to be executed. This specific scenario is very simple and it kind of replicates what I showed you before with the invoicing validator. Just going to upload an invoice to validate and then I have some validation steps that are going to, uh, to take place. Uh, and I have to pass all the validations in order to consider the test session as successful. So I'm going to click on start. I'm prompted here to provide an invoice for the validation. I'm going to provide one that I have here, submit. And now you see here that the test session is proceeding with the different steps that are configured. And in the meantime, I can actually see the different results that are coming up from the different steps. Uh, here I have a validation failure. I have here the report icon that I can actually click and see. And I see here um, a similar display such as what we saw on the, uh, the validator. So I see the different errors that come up. I can see here the, uh, the content that was validated. Uh, I can see also here the uh, different errors in context of um, uh, what went wrong, basically, so that I know what I need to uh, correct. And a final message here that gives me a kind of summary. So now I'm going to switch back and go into a more uh, elaborate test case just to show you what could be achieved through the uh, test, -based test cases. And this is focusing on the exchange of public service uh, metadata uh, aggregating them from different member states uh, through um, uh, a portal. Um, so again, I see here the details of the conformance statement. I have only one test here, again, with some basic information here on how to, I'm expected to pass it. I'll click here on play. And what you're going to see here is I actually have multiple different actors involved uh, and different steps uh, that are taking place between the different actors. Uh, so here, this is the system that is being tested. So I'm testing myself as a publication portal uh, and I'm triggering a harvester that is going to collect data from Finland, in this case in Estonia, uh, in different national formats. And this is going to be returned back to the, um, uh, to the portal for aggregation conversion to the common format, which is CPSV AP in this case, and eventually validation. Here, I need to make sure that all these steps work correctly to, um, to ensure the, the test is uh, considered successful. I'll click on start and here you see the different uh, messages being exchanged here. Interestingly, all of these are remote messages. So these are actual systems that are online. OK, these are actual simulators. Actually, we're not harvesting live data now for the demo, um, but these are all remote calls. It's all services that are being called. So uh, basically anything that is needed to capture this exchange protocol, this message exchange protocol, it's, uh, it's being uh, done here. And uh, just to give you an example, at each step of the way, I can have access to any kind of information that's being exchanged. So, for example, when I get back the information from Finland, I can click here and see that I got back here uh, JSON data from Finland. Then when uh, connecting and uh, getting back the data from Estonia, in this case. I got back uh, data in CSV uh, form. And then eventually I am doing a transformation. I'm just going to click on one example here where you can see the input output. All of this can be fully customized, though what is actually shown to users, what is returned. This is the uh, transformed output in the um, uh, CPSV AP uh, syntax. Uh, I have a final uh, uh, um, validation step here on the aggregated data, and this actually uses a, um, uh, an instance of the RDF validator. Uh, so similar to what we saw for Oslo and uh, DKTPDE, PDE. And similarly here you see a list of uh, war uh, warnings, errors and so forth that came up. So the validation failed and the overall test session is a failure. So now I can go back uh, here. As I said, everything is recorded. So for the user, I can see here all the different test sessions that I executed. Uh, I can revisit them. I can see, for example, the different uh, validation failures that came up. So I have access to everything that has uh, transpired in the past. Uh, and uh, I'm going to switch now and show you from the administrator's perspective, just so that you see this angle as well. So I'm going to switch as the community administrator of this community. Again, same welcome. And here, uh, clicking on admin, I can show you here that I can actually see as an administrator. So now I'm OK, it's it's me. It's the same account, but it could be a it could typically be a different administrator. Of course, you can see all of the testing that is being done in your community and access the same kind of information uh, that your users are seeing in case you want to verify, provide support or something like that. In addition, you can also access the conformance dashboard here where, for example, if you want to see what is the conformance testing uh, progress of a given uh, of a given organization, 
I could, for example, select it and see here what is the uh, conformance testing status uh, for the organization per specification. I could uh, make uh, I, I could export reports, generate conformance certificates and so forth. So I think with this I'm going to because now we're really uh, at the limit of our time. I think I'm going to stop with the uh, demo. Uh, I hope it illustrates what could potentially be achieved using the uh, testbed. And uh, that brings us to our final point where we can open the floor and have any questions from anyone who um, wants either on conformance testing, validation, questions to me, Bert, uh, Dwight, uh, Christian. Um, feel free, the floor is, is yours. Okay, I don't see questions in the chat. Feel free to also use the chat if you want. We can also pick up questions from there. Okay, yes, Bert, I see a raised hand. Go ahead. Yeah, as a question to, to Christian, um, with the validator now in place, um, were you able to communicate more easily uh, with your yeah, suppliers or how, uh, source suppliers and to discuss with them? Is this facilitated you? Um, yeah, th thanks for the question, uh, which uh, which uh, it really made more easy is um, for the new adapters. So the, the people, um, they are really, it was in, in the past, it was really hard for them. So they, they're like, okay, you have to do DKAP PDE and they are not used to do this RDF uh, data and stuff like for them. It's, it's really easy, uh, much more easy and to communicate with, with, with them. Um, but to be honest, we are uh, right now more in the beginning of this process, so we don't have that much uh, communication uh, right now going on. Uh, but what we saw is that, uh, for example, in our dashboard, we had uh, already a, a few things where we just saw that um, uh, in some portals, they improved their metadata quality because they saw, okay, our data uh, uh, some of our data sets don't have keywords. So, and then I, we saw that they improved, uh, that they um, added keywords at their data sets because of the dashboard. So, uh, at this point, the thing was that we don't, uh, uh, we even don't have to uh, write mails uh, to say like, okay, only 80% of your <laughs> uh, uh, data sets have keywords. So they saw that and said like, oh, why don't uh, have our data set keywords? Oh, we, we have to add them, for example. So um, what we wanted to come up with is uh, that we uh, um, um, that we uh, have uh, this automatically uh, effect that they watch a look at the uh, dashboard and then that they say, oh wow, okay, I have to 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 do with that and um, yeah. What we saw is that we have um, uh, what it meant a bit easier is also that we, uh, if we have uh, found uh, some um, mistakes at the dashboard, we can share the link to the online uh, RDF validator. It's like, yeah, if, if you would, um, uh, have, want to check, just push your data at the online validator and then you can see your, uh, um, yeah, you, you, your, your violation stuff like that. So that really makes it more, more easy for us because in, in, the, in the past we have to do a lot of uh, email stuff and yeah. yeah okay, thanks. Um, I have a similar experience for in, in the context of DCAT as well, that uh, this kind of uh, having it online and that they can do this kind of self-service and have a bit of a peak uh, preview and then the discussions in the end become much easier or that indeed uh, Sometimes they do it on their own just because of uh, the results uh, was not satisfying for them. Yeah, that 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 really is is a good point, especially when it comes to um, I think like 
RDF uh, specific uh, points with like using uh, identifier and, and, uh, and stuff like that when they are not used to it. It was really hard and now they get the failure and they can test and validate and improve it and try it out and stuff like that. I think that will save us a lot of uh, uh, money, time and nerves uh, in, the, in the future. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm seeing some uh, interesting questions in the chat as well. In the meantime, so uh, just to reiterate what I'm, uh, what I was just posting, anyone that's interested and wants to get started, either uh, using validators or potentially full conformance testing, uh, first step it's always just, uh, I mean, the ideal is just uh, drop us an email, <clears throat> especially if you are looking for the uh, conformance testing platform, because there we should discuss, uh, you know, what is the best model that make more sense to run, uh, let's say, an on-premise instance or online. Uh, for validators, uh, as validators are inherently much more simple in nature, you could, of course, use them you know, directly. So uh, go ahead and download the Docker images. If you want to be onboarded on the, um, uh, the shared instances on the cloud, then uh, just send a, a drop an email to uh, the function mailbox, which I added in the, um, in the chat. Uh, also, we have guides in terms of how to get started and so forth as part of the online documentation, so you can refer to that. Um, and in terms of, I uh, got another interesting question from uh, Konstantinos uh, about uh, what are the kind of capabilities that we support in specifications. So I posted a, a link uh, to our uh, summary page in JoinUp where we have a list of uh, the different uh, capabilities that we support out of the box. But as I said here, uh, please get in touch. Uh, if uh, you are uh, looking for something that is not there, uh, this is typically something that we always add as an extension and it's the kind of work that we prioritize. So we always try to make regular releases that are based primarily on user feedback. So if something is missing uh, and you uh, ask it, this would uh, definitely be added um, uh, with priority. Um, do we have any further questions in the chat or... Um, Anyone else? I don't see any raised hands. No more points on the chat. Uh, and we are a few minutes over, so I think that uh, we could uh, potentially um, close here. Um, so um, I can pass the floor to Peter for a closing remark. Uh, before I do so, just to point out that, because uh, this was an earlier question, that the uh, slides plus the recording of the webinar are going to be posted on the webinar's detail page and join up. And for all those who have registered, uh, I will also follow up and send an email with the um, uh, with the download links. So, Peter, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Costas. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the presenters. So, the examples from Flanders and Germany. It's uh, it was a very welcome addition to the webinar to actually see how these things are used in practice. And uh, as Costas mentioned, feel free if you want to reuse uh, the testbed, either validators or the full platform, to give us an email. If you're interested in other ISA Square solutions as well, just feel free to email us. Uh, uh, as I said, there's a whole portfolio of uh, solutions that we offer for uh, different type of things that you might need on your uh, journey when you're creating public services. Uh, and yeah, so I would I wish you a very nice rest of the afternoon and uh, hope to you know get in touch with you to discuss uh, your needs. And so. Um, have a nice day and thanks.